Hey there, welcome to the Going Scared Podcast. I'm Jessica Honecker, founder of the world-changing brand Noonday Collection, and our Going Scared community gathers here every week for direct and honest conversations that help you live a life of courage by leaving comfort and going scared. And we are on the final three countdown of your listener favorites. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite people, Amy Moffat Brown. She is co-host of the Bobby Bone Show. She also is the host of the extremely popular podcast, Four Things with Amy Brown. And she's just special. Amy is one of the most authentic people that I think I know. She's someone who is so for you and she is so disarming and has a way of talking to people that helps really just bring out their stories. She's recently taken her podcast live and it's been so fun to watch that online. I hope I can go to one of her live recordings sometime. She actually came on one of my first lives we ever did in Nashville several years ago. And she's just been a huge cheerleader of Noonday and of me personally. In this episode, we dive into Amy's story of losing her mother to cancer. And since this episode, she went on to lose her father to cancer as well and recently has navigated a divorce. And Amy really knows how to stand and walk in grief and do it with a lot of joy, which really she started a whole business inside thing that has to do with walking in joy with grief, which you'll hear about today. She shares with us her journey of finding meaning and purpose in the midst of tragedy and how she's been able to use that to help other people. So whether you've experienced loss in your own life or you just want to learn how to find hope and beauty in the midst of difficult, this combo with Amy is going to inspire and encourage you. So about a year after that, Bobby asked me to dinner and offered me a job as his co-host and I couldn't believe it. And I went home and I talked to my mom and I remember thinking, I don't even know what to do because at this point I've been at my sales job for two years, was on a great path with them. There was a lot of opportunity for growth. I had just gotten a raise, all kinds of things. And I went home and I Googled, what do radio DJs make? Um, And... I couldn't really find any information. And I, then I started to think, am I really going to base this decision on, you know, what I make? I mean, I can figure out a way to pay bills. Like this is an opportunity to be on a morning show and have so much fun. And I just remember my mom saying, if you're ever going to do this, like 24, 25 years old is the time to, you know, dabble in something. Good advice. Yeah. You never thought you would ever do because yeah, I wasn't attached to anybody Um, we would figure out a way to make it work. I did have roommates to help out with stuff. So it, I, I, I took a pay cut and I kind of took it thinking we're going to live in Austin forever and we'll just see if this radio thing works out and slowly, but surely, um, you know, we added market by market and then we were up to 25 and then we moved to Nashville and it was 40 and then now it's 108. So I still like to pretend we're just talking to one market because I don't like to think about that many people listening to how many people. (laughs) Yes. Great. That is crazy. Amy. I did not know this story at all. Like this is a crazy story. Yeah. Like had I never said hi to him at Culver's and again, there was about a year of relationship with us, not it's strictly friendship, nothing. We people, that's a big misconception. A lot of people think we had, we dated and there was this whole thing. And surely we've, you know, guys and girls can't be friends and coworkers, both single and not have something. No, like everything was platonic and professional. And, but yeah, he just surprised me with the job offer. I love that. I think it's such a great example of friendship across gender and professionally and everything else. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you another question that feels like a pivot, but I know everything's going to come together because, well, I don't know what came first here. So you have a deep love of Haiti. You just brought home your kids from Haiti. You do a ton of nonprofit work in Haiti. And I have no idea how that began. Well, that began when I, Haiti was just on my heart. So I'd already been on the show, um, maybe five years, four or five years at the time that I decided to go to Haiti. So, um, maybe even six. So the show came first. All that was, I had gone to Africa and really enjoyed traveling and, um, seeing different parts of the world and, you know, trying to, you know, just 
see where we can be used as a show, um, different things that we can get involved in. And Mm -hmm. Africa was, I mean, we do stuff locally in the United States all over too. I don't, I don't like to see the borders when it comes to that. Although you would think that that's just obvious, like who cares where you're helping people, but not to, you know, pigeonhole the country community, but we are in country radio. And that's been like a weird thing, inviting people that are very Mm. pro America. Um, and I'm pro America. I mean, my husband was in the air force for 12 years. Like I love our country. Uh, but sometimes it's hard for people to hold both these tensions and you can, and you can love the people in your backyard and you can love people in Africa. Like that can exist. So Haiti was on your heart, but like, how did Haiti get on your heart? Like, was it the earthquake? Um, the earthquake had happened. Yes. And I was on a mission committee at church and there was teams going down and I couldn't ever make a trip work with um, a team. And my husband and I were living in North Carolina because he was stationed at Fort Bragg. And it just kept coming into my mind. Like, I got to get to Haiti. I want to get to Haiti. And that's, I guess what I mean by it was just on my heart. And, but nothing was ever working out until I learned of a group from Austin that was going. And I cold, like I basically cold called them. I emailed and said, Hey, friend of a friend of a friend's cousin's mailman said, y'all are going to Haiti. <laughs> like, and it happens. I'm to- seeing a theme here <laughs> that you are not afraid to ask for what you want, which is awesome. Well, yeah. And so I just said it, ha- the dates you're going literally are dates that I am available to go. So if I can tag along and then through that got involved at the orphanage and then through that kind of met various other groups in Haiti. It's almost like it was just organic networking that started to happen. And through the show, um, we knew we wanted to do a lot. And obviously I, I fell in love immediately and I've been so many times. I mean, since I started going in 2012, been four or five times a year again from Nashville, which is crazy that we had moved here right when my love for Haiti, after my first trip to Haiti and my heart exploded for those people. Um, the people there, I, I, Nashville has a huge heart for Haiti. And that happened to be where the Bobby bone show moved me. So it was so, it was almost like this perfect little puzzle that God was piecing together. And, um, my Haiti network here is strong. Um, and I love everybody that is involved down there. And, and from that, we, we saw various needs where we wanted to get involved and we used pimp and joy through the show to help with Haiti. And then after that, decided to take it another level with my friend, Mary, and started a line called Espoir, which means hope in Haitian Creole, which gives back to Haiti. Whereas Pimp and Joy gives back to various things and still goes back to Haiti. But Espoir is like all Haiti, all in. Anything you get from Espoir goes to Haiti. So, Okay, so let's pause there because sales to radio personality to advocate, really. I know that Pimp and Joy was birthed out of your mom's death. So tell us a little bit more about the story behind Pimp and Joy. Yeah, well, it's special to me too, because she got to see a little bit of it unfold because it started while she was still living. And she, listeners were in, I shared her cancer journey on air and they were invested in her story. And I was like, mom, listeners want to follow along to your day. And they would see me post on social. And I just remember someone being like, you need to make your mom a Twitter account or something. And this is when Twitter was bigger than Instagram and, um, in my world. And so I created, you know, her theme through cancer was choosing joy. Like that's all she wanted to do. My sister and I even got joy tattoos on our wrists, like in our mom's handwriting while she was still alive. And Anyway, she needed a Twitter handle and Judy chooses joy and anything really obvious like that was all taken. So I jokingly typed in Judy be pimp and joy and it was available. And so I thought, you know what? Let's just go with that. It's available. We were bored at MD and Anderson, MD Anderson hospital, like sitting in the waiting room. I remember creating the account there and then her doing her first tweets. And then from that, Bobby was like, you know, hashtags, like we should do hashtag pimp and joy and have listeners share with us how they're choosing joy in their life or how they're spreading joy to others and have them hashtag pimp and joy so we can follow along on social media. And then 
that's what we did. And from that it was born. And then about two weeks before my mom died, we created our first ever pimp and joy hat with Mary at the shop forward. And my mom got to see the prototype and then the hats were not even available, but Mary made a bunch right after my mom passed away and shipped them to the house for her funeral. So every single pallbearer and anyone that spoke at the funeral, like men, they wore a pimp and joy hat. Um, and they were black. Like everything was very fitting. Um, not that you have to wear black and be dark, but I mean, it just looked good. Like they looked sharp. They were in their black suits with their black Pip and joy hat. Like it looked very uniform. And that was something that was really special because we, you know, it, it wasn't planned. And then Mary was really forward thinking and the hats were not ready, but she just sent them to us. And then I would say a few weeks after she died, we put the hats up for sale and we only made a couple thousand because we didn't know what they would do. And all the money was going to go to St. Jude. And Mary thought her website was broken because the hat sold out in less than 60 seconds. And Whoa. Um, that's when we knew, okay, wait, maybe we're on to something. So she made a couple thousand more and those sold out within 60 seconds. Again, she still thought, I think my website's broken. I don't know. But um, it wasn't. It was people were just responding and wanting to um, wear the joy and spread the joy. And again, all the money goes, to, 100% goes to the cause, which at that time was cancer related. So we had chosen St. Jude. But it's just, Pimp and Joy is a movement. It's a celebration. It's dedicated to people that are going through a rough time, you know, but they choose to find the joy in their daily lives, which is what my mom did while she battled cancer. So it's really beautiful to see that spread. And since then, you know, $1.5 million or more, maybe at this point, um, has been donated because of Pimp and Joy. So like my mom's death, like, while or watching her battle cancer and go through such a painful death was um, really, really hard and taxing on our family, good can come from bad. And my mom's prayer during her third diagnosis, we were at the chapel at MD Anderson, and she just said, it was a very selfless prayer. She just said, Lord, use this cancer for good. And she wasn't saying, Lord, heal me, Lord, save me. Although obviously, you know, that's what she wanted. But at that point, I think she had just thrown her hands in the air and she's like, okay, cancer's back for a third time. Lord, just use this cancer for good. And so for me, um, anytime I see someone wearing a pimp and joy hat or shirt or carrying a tote or wearing a hoodie or, you know, whatever, um, because the line has expanded since then, um, um, that's an answer to my mom's prayer. Um, and you know, she wasn't like the biggest fan of pimping and we've debated that even on the show, um, because we've given money to various, um, sex trafficking, uh, organizations. And we really have been involved. Like our giving is very diverse and organically through different involvement, like with my sister and certain groups that like our sex trafficking groups, we've been able to donate to those groups. And we just don't really, we never want credit or take credit for anything, but we put stuff out there and rightfully so the groups have wanted the money, but they've been like, Hey, we may not really, you know, say that we have a partnership or something with pimp and joy. And we're like, we get it. It's fine, but we love what you're doing and you're making a difference in this world. And we want to to give to that. So we understand that sometimes people may not want to be associated with it and that's fine. But as long as we, in our hearts, like we know the roots of it and I know the meaning of it and I know how special it is to me and I, a lot of our mm -hmm. listeners that have used it in their own struggles, that it's just too special to change. And we've had some people yeah. hate on us for that, but it's just, I, it's just, you know, it's too special, I'm not changing it. So tell me a story about your mom that stands out to you pre-cancer, where you saw this, where it shaped you, it shaped you to be someone because Amy, you are just following in your mom's footsteps. I mean, I'm going to cry right now, but you have been through some tough stuff, infertility, the death of your mom, and you have chosen joy. Her strength and tenacity has always amazed me and impressed me is where I am 
pretty vulnerable and, and share a lot. Like she's strong. Like I think she could be vulnerable at times, but I will say when my dad left when I was eight years old and maybe I just turned nine, but whatever he, he left. And I saw my mom go from a stay at home mom to a woman that then worked, went to work every single day and worked well. And she was a good employee. And I know that, um, but she, again, you're going from a life where she did not have to work to then raising two kids because we lived with her to then, you know, still showing up, still taking care of the house. And remember she would wake up and do her, like have the house clean and vacuum and have done her Bible study and prayed every morning before I even woke up. But that's the only time she had to herself where she could do that. And, um, I never once saw my mom complain or speak ill of my dad, even though he left her for another woman. I never heard my mom say anything ill about the other woman. I never saw my mom cry. And um, I think that is where I first saw her, the type of woman that she was. You don't get to thrive through cancer like that or choose joy through cancer all of a sudden. Like that comes a lifetime of your mom choosing joy, even before cancer. And then you have had to really latch onto that as you have struggled with infertility and then entered into an adoption process that felt like it took like an eternity. Four years is a long time. I mean, that is a long time. I was talking with one of my friends this morning, telling her, hey, I'm about to interview Amy Brown, who has gone through infertility and now adoption. And she is going through the exact same thing. She's been struggling with infertility. They're now in the adoption process. And I was like, what would be helpful for you to hear? And she was like, I want you to ask her to share all the things that have been extremely unhelpful for her to hear throughout the years from other people. And I was like, that's actually a really good thought because so many of us say stupid things and we don't even know they're stupid and we just need someone to tell us not to say them. So what are some phrases, words, sentiments that we should avoid when walking with a friend through infertility or possibly adoption? Oh gosh. I'm trying to think back to the years where I was really in the infertility side. Um, I mean, now I feel like I'm more on the adoption side, so I can speak to that right away, which is for five, six, no, we were in the Haiti process for almost five years and then domestically, maybe two years domestically. So I had a seven year adoption span where I had people telling me, um, you know, when you adopt, you're going to get pregnant (laughs) and I'm guilty. I, I think we've just somewhere along the way, everyone's heard that and they don't really know what to say. So they just say that because I know I'm sure I I, I'm sure somewhere in my life, I'm guilty of being like, you know, I heard of this one girl that right after they adopted, they got pregnant. So once your body relaxes and you can just not be stressed about it, you'll get pregnant. Well, that's another thing. So that's, that's in relation to adoption, but it's also just, that was when we were trying to get pregnant way before adoption was even on our brain. It was like, you know, do you think you're just focusing too much on it? And once you just chill out a little bit, it'll happen. And I just remember being like, I feel like I'm pretty chill about it. Do you feel like I'm not being chill about it? I, I, I know I cry every month when I start my period and I'm reading books <laughs> and I'm doing handstands and like some weird Jane Fonda move on the bed, but like, uh, but I mean, I'm pretty chill. Like I, I don't really feel like I was ever stressed, but that was something that definitely got annoying. And of course the one person that says it to you, they're not trying to be annoying. But then when 10 people say to you, it just, it just adds up. So I would say like, if you've got a, you know, like, don't, don't try to, if your friend or acquaintance or someone at your church or someone you work with is going through that, like, don't try to solve it for them. There's nothing you can do to solve their issue. Just be an ear. If they need an ear, give them a hug. If they need a hug, like take them out to get a glass of wine if they're not pregnant, which clearly they're probably not. So they might, you know, go, (laughs) go do whatever, like whatever you can be to just be a friend to that someone, not try to give them 
you know, your two cents, unless of course you all have very similar stories and you've been through the exact same thing and you can actually share some advice, not just some surface comments that you think are going to be comforting because it's not going to do anything like you they can't change it or try, you know, I'm not sharing with you so that you can fix it or, or anything. And I, you know, I think that's a lot of times, sometimes when we're sharing, we're just trying to get something off my, ch- our chest. We're not necessarily looking for a solution. Um, and then we're going to work through it in our own way. And for my husband and I, it was very difficult because doctors couldn't even tell us what was wrong. Um, I know it could probably be hard to hear, well, you've got this wrong with you. So this is why, and you have to accept that, but it's also really hard to hear like, well, we don't really know why you're not getting pregnant. So, um, you know, you should try this. So we tried Clomid, which is as far as we went with fertility treatments. Um, once Clomid wasn't working mainly because I was psychotic on it, um, which Clomid is a pill that makes your eggs more attractive, if you will, uh, to the sperm. It makes them want to be like, Hey, come here. Um, but yeah, I just got off that and instantly felt like adoption was more the route we should go with our finances. I mean, it's, it's weird to look at it as some weird transaction, but at the end of the day, fertility treatments are extremely expensive. Adoption is expensive and you got to make a choice. And we knew that we were called to, um, to a child that had already been born instead of investing in trying to create something, which nothing against that by any means it's just not where we felt we were, we were going to go. Okay. So you decided to adopt. And so that was really born out of an infertility story though. Would you say that's accurate? Oh, a hundred percent. Haiti happened organically because we were, we had chosen to go the route of adoption and not do anything fertility wise, got off Clomid, got everything still obviously having sex, whatever, but that's about it. Still not getting pregnant by the way. And, uh, you know, we, once I started going to Haiti and seeing the older children at the adoption, at the orphanage, excuse me, I thought I just could not stop thinking about them. And we were having such a weird experience domestically with babies that I thought, you know, I used to pray, Lord, like, I just want to be a mom. Like, I just want to get pregnant. Please let this be the month I get pregnant. And you know what? That prayer wasn't answered. And I had to accept that because he had adoption on the horizon. And I used to be like, okay, Lord, I remember we were almost matched with this mother in Florida and she was giving birth like in a couple of months. And then it didn't work out. It was a really bizarre thing, but I was like, Lord, like, what is the deal? I just, we just want to be parents. Like we want a baby domestically. And then we switched to, um, then it was like these older kids at the orphanage were just I could not stop thinking about them. And then my husband went down and met them and we saw the need for older kids and that like all the babies were matched, but the older kids were not. And that's when the light bulb sort of went off and we were like, oh my goodness, we're down for adopting older kids. And not everybody's down for that. And I don't think everybody should be, and it's fine. And I don't even know now that I'm as down for it as I thought I was. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I, I do feel like we, we it is exactly what we were supposed to do. But had God answered my prayer when I wanted to get pregnant and he had he answered our prayers when we wanted, you know, a newborn domestic baby, then we wouldn't have these two beautiful children from Haiti that are now 10 and seven years old and they would still be living in the orphanage. You know? Okay. And tell us about them. Tell us about them. Well, uh, Sashira is amazing. She is about to be 11 and, um, she could pretty much raise herself. And I love that about their love that about her, but I hate that for her because Mm -hmm. she had to grow up so fast. Um, Mm -hmm. now again, as you know, like she's older, so she has, you know, she arrived here when she was 10. So she has her own story and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, she's been through a lot. Like she lived with her mom till she was five. And then from five to 10, she lived at the orphanage and, uh, then she came here. So in a lot of ways, I feel like she's on her third life and, uh, we're, we're working through some of that, but she is smart 
and beautiful and kind and feisty. And one day, if she ever gets on the TV show Survivor, she will have every alliance known to man Mm -hmm. and she will win that thing because homegirl knows how to survive. She's a survivalist. Mm -hmm. And I see it in her every day. And I see it in her it, it's part of her spunk. It's part of her character. It's part of her awesomeness, but it's also part of her defiance. Um, mm-hmm. you know, she's like, wait a second, you're going to tell me what to do because <laughs> I'm yeah. good. Like I got this whole life thing down. I'm like, okay, really? So, but to see her break down some of those walls that have been built mm-hmm. up the last few months, oh, like it just, It makes me want to smile and cry all at the same time because it's Mm -hmm. so beautiful. And then Stevenson is seven and he was dropped off at the orphanage when he was about a month old. So his entire life is at the orphanage and he'll be eight this summer. And he has this infectious laugh and, you know, just this zeal for life that I already see in him. And while our communication barrier has been there because they speak Creole, but their English is getting so so much better. And I don't speak any Creole because second languages are not my thing. Uh, I, you know, we still communicate well and, and I just can't wait till the day we're like, we're full blown able to share exactly what we're processing and feeling and sharing, because I just feel like I'm going to learn so much. And I'm excited about that, but I can just see so much inside of him itching to get out, but he just doesn't really know how to say it all yet. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I was cuddling with Jack last night and he shares a room with his other brother, Holden and Holden's out of town. And so I was like, Jack, you know, what are you going to share with me? And we just cuddled for the longest time. And I just have to say, I mean, we're five years in and the transformation that has happened. And it's one of those transformations that's happened so slowly. You have to stop and remember the fight and flight that used to happen all the time. (sighs) Yeah that absolutely put me, uh, my response to the fight flight was horrible. Like it triggered some deep stuff in me. And I have to tell you, I had the most profound moment a couple years ago at a small leadership treat with this psychiatrist named Kurt Thompson. And he walked off the stage and I ran up to him and I was like, I am not responding well to my son's, you know, flight um, reaction to, mm-hmm. you know, all this trauma, adoption and abandonment. And all abandonment. Yeah. Yeah. And attachment. attachment. And he looked at me and he said, what is that calling out in you? Because God brought Jack into your life to heal you too. Mm. And I started bawling because there was something there of like, yes, it is calling out to me something. And I ended up going on a sort of a healing journey then of realizing some of the things that was triggering in me. And it just was this whole beautiful thing to realize, like he, he came into my life to trigger me so that I could be healed too, you know? Yeah. Showing them that it's just so foreign to me growing up in a loving family, even though my parents split, I still had, I still had that. I mean, I had some, my own abandonment issues because of my dad, but, and I still knew what family was. And when you're trying to show to, you know, old, older kids, not babies, but I mean, babies still experience this too, being adopted, but, um, you know, trying to show them what a family looks like, it's just, they don't, and you want them to understand and you just, you know, I, I, mean, I can't tell you how many times I ran to my closet and just, or I've run to my closet. It's been fewer far between. So like to hear you say it five years, I mean, I got goosebumps when you were sharing that with me because I feel like sometimes we're on such a good roll right now. And then it's like, uh-huh, we're not there yet. I'm only three months in and I have to be patient, Yeah, but you just got to write it out. And I'm thankful for people like you and Jamie Ivy and Tracy Hamilton and that have like been real with me and honest with me of like, this isn't all roses. It's tough, but it does. It does get, it gets better. I know everyone tells you this, but it, um, you know, I can say five years in now, it's pretty profound that the, the transformation of a home and of, attachment and love and and all of that stuff. I want to jump to your friendship that you have with Mary who owns the shop 
forward. And she was the one you alluded to earlier who made all these pimp and joy hats for your mom's memorial service. Now, since then, you have started Espoir, which in Creole means hope in Haiti. And now it's all of these products that give back to different organizations in Haiti. How did you get to know Mary? Was it through this whole product need? And, and like, <laughs> y'all's friendship is so beautiful, I just have to say. And I'm like, man, she shows up for you and you show up for her. And it's pretty amazing. Well, we met on Twitter. I think to quote Mary's sister the best, Mary has a really good uh, social media online personality. <laughs> Uh Like she's just really good at engaging with people and like feeling like your friends right away. And it's not, but, but not in a weird, creepy way of like, who's this person on Twitter. So fast forward to like, we've, we've friends online, but she was going to Africa and I had gone to Africa. We had a lot in common. And so we started corresponding about her trip to Kenya. And then she had seen that I was going to Haiti and she's like, you know, I've always wanted to go to Haiti. I said, okay, well, let's go. So legit, the first time I ever met her face to face in person was at the Miami airport on our way to Port-au-Prince. <laughs> that is so awesome. So did she start at this shop in order to like provide the products to Pimp and Joy? Well, she always, and you know, she'll, that's, this is like, it's her baby, but she always had a vision for the shop forward in her mind that she, she was going to do it one day and she's already in the clothing business and, you know, really, um, you know, smart and business savvy and successful, but wasn't really fulfilling her, like her, her main clothing stuff wasn't really fulfilling the things she wants to do to give back. So she always knew she wanted the shop forward, but it pimp and joy was her first, uh, you know, line, if you will. So she, expedited things into action because of Pimp and Joy. From there, other lines have started. And one thing that we decided to start one day out of, out of sort of desperation for the orphanage, they had hit a financial crisis. And we were like, what can we do to throw something up on the shop forward to, or what can we create together, you know, that we can put out to our audience and sell and I looked down at my tattoo and I, below my mom's tattoo where I have joy, I had, I had tattooed espoir for my kids so that I could look down and see joy and hope and know that I had hope they were going to be home with me one day. And then, mm. um, so we took my tattoo is in typewriter font. So we took that typewriter font and just started designing a t-shirt and our t-shirt was our very first thing and then did a tank top and a sweatshirt and then started selling stuff just to fundraise for the orphanage. And then uh, once some of that got under control, we started to learn about other groups in Haiti and we wanted to diversify our giving. And then these four things totes, which we put under the Espoir brand, Mary gave me one for my birthday. And then we had them online, like a picture of it. And people were freaking out. It's like the best idea ever. I just love this tote. Yeah. Mary, for my birthday, I think two years ago, she put on my very first one, I think it said yoga, pimp and joy, green juice, and Dirks Bentley were my very first four things. And that was her gift to me. And then again, I think the orphanage fell under something like the nannies needed to get paid. And it was like a big sum. We were like, okay, what can we do? And we were, I remember we were on a walk one day and we just decided let's do four things totes and let's put it under a spa and raise a bunch of money for the orphanage. And so we did it. And then the four things totes have just taken off and they're so fun and amazing. Like they're the best gift ever because it's thoughtful and it's personalized or you can either, it's fun. fun And you know, it's a really, we've made sure that they're really well-made, awesome tote bags. It's, um, and oh, I've taken mine all over the world now. Yeah. It's the best travel bag, beach bag. I mean, I'm not pumping it up, but at the same time, it's been allowing us to do so much for different groups in Haiti that I don't think we ever thought we would be able to, to we would be able to do. And now yes. being an adoptive mom, I'm like, okay, these people are down in Haiti doing like the real deal work. Like these are pregnant yes. women that they would not survive if people like Tara Lindsay did not exist and have a heart and a passion to give and train midwives and help these women have a safe 
birth where they're giving them this medical information and postpartum care and child development education, all these things that they need that we take for granted here, sort of. I mean, Mm -hmm. we kind of just do. And down there, I mean, literally this could be a difference in life and death. And oh, yeah, it's so powerful. So, we visited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Tara told us, I didn't know that Haiti has the highest infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate in this entire hemisphere. And the work they're doing is so, so good. Yeah, They're just doing great. It just, it excites me that we can now reach out because we're, you know, Espoir is growing. It allows us to kind of want to throw a net out and talk to different people that are doing cool things and being like, Hey, how can we come alongside you and help you? Like, what, what are you doing? That's cool. And so that has been, and it just all happened so organically. It literally was the orphanage and something Mary and I are brainstorming. I look down at my wrist and I'm like, okay, this is Espoir. What can we do? Espoir. Okay. So how do we order this tote? Well, you can go to the shop Um, and the Espoir line is under there and you just custom, you pick out your four things, fill out the sheet and then boom, it'll arrive in the mail. If anybody listening knows of someone doing something awesome in Haiti, hit us up, um, shop Espoir on Instagram and, you know, let us know. I love to know what cool things people are doing in Haiti. And so does Mary. Like we both have a heart for it and want to try to continue to see how we can best come alongside. So awesome. Okay. We need to wrap this up, but I could not resist Amy. One time you told me sort of your future career eventual dream could be to be Delilah. Yeah. And you were like, so, Delilah. I was like, who's Delilah? <laughs> and I'm Tell like, me about Delilah. I'm like, what? You don't know Delilah. <laughs> I don't know where I was during Delilah, but apparently not listening to Delilah. But let me tell you, I'm the only one because I put it out on our Noonday Collection Ambassador Facebook page. I said, okay, guys, I'm about to interview Amy Brown. I'm not telling her this, but she could be the next Delilah. And so I asked them to put out different life situations they're in. And then you are going to name that song to go with their life situation. Are you ready? <laughs> um, okay. Yes. Yeah, ready. Okay. Mari says, I just lost my job and there's ups and downs plus opportunities ahead. Name that song, Amy. Okay. So for that one, I'm going to go with one that's fresh on my brain and it's Dirk Bentley riser. Do you know that song? Not yet, but I'm going to look it up. Okay. It's so good. And it's just about being a riser. How am I going to rise above this? And I don't know. That one comes on when I work out and I work out harder because I'm going to, if I'm feeling defeated, I'm going to rise. That's awesome. Because I'm a riser. I'm sure I've heard it. Okay. Jennifer Mitchell tree said she wants a song request to her sons that it's about not growing up too fast or leaving them too soon. Oh, what about forever young, Jay-Z? Love it. (laughs) Can't go wrong with that. Um, Clean version. Well, clean version. I'm sure they have a clean version out there. Okay. Rachel (laughs) Dinoff. I am thankful and in love with my husband. We've grown so much over the past few years and we're just great together. What's a good love song? Um, Randy Travis forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Oh, I yeah. love me some Randy. Mm-hmm. Wendy Johnson says we just adopted a baby boy and girl twins and we're in the country right now and we need a song to celebrate life and adoption. Gosh, one song that I listened to on repeat sometimes when I was getting back from Haiti and dealing with the long awaited adoption process was Audio Journal and Kings and Queens. Oh yeah. Yes. Because I mean, you're doing that. You, I mean, I don't know if these, Oh, are they twin, a boy and a girl? You're yes. That's perfect. A king and a queen. You just rescued a king and a queen. I love it. So cool. Yeah. Okay. This next one, I know Nikki well, actually, and her sister just got diagnosed with breast cancer. So I wanted you to name that song for her. And she says, my request would be a song that represents strength of sister bonds. My sister just had her second chemo treatment yesterday and anything that brings love and light to her across the distance that I'm feeling from being 
away would be incredible. Oh gosh, that's hard because I feel like any song would just make me cry like crazy regarding that subject and my sister. Um, and this one probably will do that, but I feel like this just is my sister. She's the wind beneath my wings. (laughs) Um, Bette Midler. So we'll take it back to beaches on that one. Yeah. Take it back. You can always, you can always be safe with beaches. Yes. Yes, you can. Well, Amy, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Jessica. You're awesome. Thanks so much for joining us on this series. It's been really fun to go back and revisit these episodes and really kind of see who our listeners are listening to. And thanks so much for leaving a review, chiming in, tell us what you're learning through this series. Amy shared with us her personal journey of loss and grief, and she reminded us that even in the midst of our darkest moments, there's always potential for growth and healing. All right, we are down to the final two. Who do you think's coming on at number two? I can't wait to share with you. I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.